Since we're starting to record the Zoom, I guess we're going to start our meeting. Underway. Welcome to the studio, everybody. Isn't this great? I mean, this is uh, this is what we've been working on for the last year or more. And now, uh, as a result of having this space, we've decided to have some of our general meetings here on a regular basis. So um, in the future, at least for the next four or five months, we will probably be in this facility unless our attendance gets really, really large and we can't squeeze everybody in here. Theoretically, according to the fire marshal, we have a capacity of 49, but if you don't count, I won't count if we if we go over that. So I think it's what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's true uh i want to thank everybody for attending um we have a just a little bit of business to kind of get through before we get to our presenter tonight uh first and foremost i want to thank the outgoing board of the organization um most of the people on that were board members last year continued on several rolled off and several new members have uh joined the board a couple of people on the board have moved up to uh, different positions mike Sandman, for example has moved up from the membership director to vp of of membership mike over here uh taking his slot in the um membership director role is uh stewart brown brown i knew that I knew that. I even wrote it down. I thought he was going to be here tonight, so he didn't show up yet. Okay, well, so when Stuart walks in the door, everybody applaud and thank him for being the membership director. Um, Kate Thornton, I know, is here. Kate has stepped up, and she's our secretary. Uh, an important role within the, within the organization. Uh, and I think we have her email squared away. So if you've been sending Kate email uh, at her guild address, I think it's working now. Perfect. Because I sent her 10 days worth of email thinking everything was lined up <laughs> and none of them got there. Um, I want to thank the folks who uh, took charge of our holiday party last month. Uh, I wasn't able to attend. But I had COVID too close to me and uh, didn't want to uh, risk coming to the event and be turning it into a super spreader event. So even though I never contracted it, I had two family members who were living in the same house. We had COVID in the house for two weeks straight. And um, neither my wife or I ever have, have ever come down with it or had come, come down with it. So knock on wood, all good there. But I want to thank uh, Joe Wheaton uh, for coordinating the whole event, getting the food together, getting the space together. I want to thank Glenn MacArthur for organizing what I understand was a rather fun and raucous gift exchange. Um, and I want to thank Mike Sandman for acting as the master of ceremonies and, you know, gathering up all the, the materials that we needed for that night, picking up awards from my house and taking them over to the event and taking care of the meeting and then putting together the meeting minutes. So thank you very much to, to all of you. Um, Bill, Bill Tainer, where are you? You want to say a few words? You have to, you need to come up here though, so that so people can see you from in the crowd. Hi, I'm the um, volunteer appreciation program lead, and we've had this twice a year. We ask people to report their volunteer hours. Can't hear you, Bill. Twice a year, we have. We ask our volunteers to report how many hours they spent volunteering for the guild. Can you hear them now? Just barely. Just barely, yeah. Okay. Does it need better? We'll see. Just okay. yell into the mic. <laughs> um, twice a year, we ask our wonderful volunteers to report how many hours they volunteer in the previous six months. And uh, Bland has sent out a notice in the, his weekly uh, emails and had a good response. But I just wanted to remind people that uh, send those hours in. Uh, have until the end of this week to do that if you could. Um, and it's not only for some people think, well, I don't want any guild gear. I don't really need that. 
so I'm not going to send my hours in. Well, it's for two reasons. One is we appreciate the volunteers, and you can get good guild gear like a shirt or a hat, other things like that. Uh, you can also, with your volunteer time, get some shop time. Uh, but also on, on top of that, it helps us keep track of how many hours all of our great members volunteer to keep this organi organization going. And uh, it uh, things that people log in on the computer and the shop, I have no access to that. Carol's pretty good about getting it out if I ask her for it, but it's a lot of work for her. So it's just easier if the uh, members just send me an email and let me know. I, I just don't, I don't need to have a breakdown of how many in this. And how a many tenth of, of an hour for your lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unless you're a lawyer. Um, so just, just your best guesstimate on overall, how many hours you spent in the previous six months. And uh, if you get those weekly emails from Bland, my address is in that. You'll see a, a section in that email, but it's bill.tainter at guildoforganwoodworkers.org. Um, but yeah, we appreciate that and hoping to open the catalog catalog for our guild gear the next week after that, the week of the 22nd. So yeah, please uh, send in your hours if you have any. Thank you, Bill. I can't tell you, uh, I can't um, express enough how important it is to log our hours. Um, as many of you know, over the last year, we beat you to death asking you for money as part of our uh, capital campaign to fund the improvements improvement. to this facility here, uh, make improvements in, the, in our existing shop. Um, this next year, we tend to reach out into the community. And one of the things. And so we move for a crab roll sandwich. Everybody mute themselves on Zoom. All you Zoom people, mute yourselves, please. Official cause of death was forced compression of a larynx. So you can mute everybody from the. Uh, Alan, mute yourself. Alan, mute yourself. Right now, it was a crab roll using bitter. Bring up the participants list here, and then you can mute everybody. Wow, that was scary. The official cause of death was. <laughs> but one of the things that we want to do, we, we, we have a long-term plan, or at least idea in our mind, uh, about where we want to take the guild and where we want to be in three, five years. And one of those goals at the end of three years is we have some very serious decisions to make about our space. Our lease here is going to expire in three years. When we acquired this space, renewed our lease for the existing space, our rents went up and our fixed cost went up across the board. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in three years. Ideally, I think collectively the board and, and, and people that have been planning and working on planning in the organization over the last several years would like to have our own building. I mean, how great would that be if we had our own building? Maybe we shared it with other maker types and began to make a collective. We're dreaming, but we, we got to think that way. So where I was headed was volunteer hours are important because we intend to extend our fundraising efforts into the community. And one of the things that organizations that give organizations like us money are, well, what are your members doing? How much time are they putting in? How are they? And so the, the more we can record, the more we can show our involvement in the community, I think the better our chances of receiving funds from others are gonna be. So our volunteers are important. And with that, each year, we give an award to that we've named the Woodworker of the Year. And past recipients have included individuals like Ed Ferguson, Steve Pollan, uh, Abu, Julie Niemeyer, who am I forgetting? Who was on that committee with you? Roger Crook. Roger Crook. Um, Yeah, Lewis. 
in the past. Yes. So this year, we did the selection process a little bit different than we had in the past. In the past, it had been a, a board decision. But because we have a number of our past recipients um, still involved in the organization, I asked Ed Ferguson to chair a committee of past recipients and make the selection. And so with that, I'm going to ask Ed to come up and present this year's. We, we already made the announcement at the holiday party, but the individual wasn't there. So they know they're getting it. Right, Carol? <laughs> so, <laughs> but I'd like to ask Ed to, to say a few. Why don't you stand behind, Sue? I think they can see you better. Okay. Carol? We're trying to get you in here so we can give you this. We um, regaled you last month for your accomplishments. Um, and they include uh, your board membership, but also um, your support of and as a leadership, a leadership role with shop attendants, your, of course, your leadership role on toy build. You take a lead in all the shows and events. Um, but we polled all of the shop attendants, all of the instructors, all of the program leads. So there was a broad consensus that you deserve this award. So come in and get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll actually, I'll be there One tomorrow the afternoon. <laughs> okay, Carol, I, I thought you for sure you were going to be here tonight. So <laughs> I was planning on it, but I ended up spending most of yesterday there on maintenance and Dick Rohrbaugh talked me into helping him tomorrow afternoon for class. So I kind of thought I'd take a day of not driving to the shop. Well, you you just uh, um, took a little bit of my examples because one <laughs> of the things that Carol does are things that nobody sees. And uh, uh, Abu and Chop Operations has shifted over now to instead of doing a Monday night tune up. They're going to do a once a month deep clean on the third Wednesday of the month. So, you know, Abu and others were in here, Ken and, and others were in here uh, helping with that. And there was Carol, you know, and she is there just, you know, all over the place and in ways that, you know, most of us aren't even aware of. So very deserving of the award. Congratulations, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Carol. Thank you. Um, speech. Speech. Yeah. <laughs> Speech. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> and I will be there tomorrow afternoon. I can, if you have it, if you're going to be there for project build, I'll be in the studio so I can meet you in the parking lot or something. Okay. Well, we've told your story two meetings in a, in a <laughs> yep. uh, newsletter article. So I guess we'll just give you a quiet hand. All, all I want, all I want is a picture of you holding the award so we can put it in the newsletter. Okay. Right. We can do that. Well, I, we'll so, do that. so make yeah. sure that that happens and, and, We'll be happy. So, All right. so tomorrow afternoon? Tomorrow afternoon, yep. Okay. All right. So All right. We're, going, we're going to do... We're going to do another one. Okay. We're going to do another award. And I've, I've asked Ed to make the presentation, but this month's, th this next award is the Volunteer of the Month. And this is an award we try to give every month, obviously. The last two recipients, including tonight, are individuals that shocked me that they hadn't gotten it previously. They're individuals that are always involved in something. They're behind the scenes. They're very quiet. Uh, and with that, I'm going to let you continue with the okay. You need the thing. Or well, tonight's right? recipient is always there behind the scenes, very <laughs> quiet. <laughs> um, the, this month's recipient of the Volunteer of the Month Award. Let me get a prop here. Uh, is oh, is one of the mainstays of uh, Project Bill, and she, clue to who, who, might, who it might be, um, came here from Albuquerque uh, six or seven years ago, and she brought a wealth of knowledge. And some of the work she featured was featured in one of our um, Guild General meetings for some of the work she did in Albuquerque. Uh, and she's very artistic, but not only that. Um, she'll, she's jumps in and likes to learn new things and she masters them. And before long, she's the one that's teaching other people how to do these things. So I'm talking about Flora. So Flora, why don't you come on up here?
So, and she um, she also has been a, a participant in shows and events. Uh, I know she's dragged her husband Jim to assemble birdhouse kits and that kind of thing. So she's she is a person who a lot of the guild don't see, but you, you should know about her because she really makes a great contribution. And we're going to get a picture. But not with Bland in the background, please. Oh, we, we don't want Bland's <laughs> backside here. <laughs> All right. We're going to do one more. Hang on. Okay. Because I need to make sure that Linda has a good photograph. All right. Congrats. Flora, congratulations. <laughs> Okay, so with that, my notes are where? Here. With that, I'm going to, can we go back to Joe Wheaton and then he can do, Joe, I'm gonna call on you to give the intro to our, for our speaker. So from here on out, it's, uh, it's remote. Okay. okay. Hey, hello, everybody. Um, our speaker tonight is uh, John Harden. And um, um, for those of you who went to gather the guilds last year, you may have seen John's booth there. Uh, John has um, uh, makes a whole variety of things, and you can see him here, here in this picture. I, uh, is everybody seeing this picture? It should be the uh, sharing should be working, right? Well, hearing no dissent, I think it's going to be okay. So when when I saw John's stuff at the at uh, the gathering of the guilds, my first thought was, how does he do that? And uh, as for those of you who've tuned in to these presentations every month, you'll know that that's kind of one of the things that drives my quest for speakers is to try to find people or to the, to find people who do things that I can't even imagine can be done. And John fills this bill perfectly because uh, when I saw his bowls, I went, whoa, how does he do that? Um, John's a turner. Uh, we have many different types of presentations and I wanted to make sure that uh, there, we cover a variety of topics. I'm not a turner myself, but, I, but this is a perfect opportunity to really play up what turners can do. Um, John, hopefully you're not muted. And uh, could you? Oh, I, I would need to do a little couple, uh, put a couple ground rules. Um, one, I put some contact information in the chat, so for, so that anybody who's on Zoom can see that. And if you see the recording, you can get that too. Um, you'll be able to uh, see the contact information for John. Now, basically, John Harden Design. That's H A R D E N. Is is how his name is spelled, as you can see here, and I've got the contact information up there. So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I've lost uh, Joe, though. Yeah, everything's gone quiet. Could you hear me now? Yep. yep. Oh, I don't have any idea what happened there. Um, um, where was I? Oh, the contact information for John's up in the chat. Uh, people who are using Zoom, if they want to uh, uh, ask a question, just put it in the chat and I'll get to it when I can. If you're in the studio, why don't you uh, pass it on up to or just... Uh, uh have ed read it into the microphone when we get a you know any kind of break we get in the presentation and uh we'll try to get your questions in i'll make time at the end for questions and uh so um without that without any more ado let's get on with it uh, J uh john um it's a real pleasure to have you here i really appreciate all the work you've done in preparing this presentation uh it's really i think it's going to be really great for our our people to see it um can you give me a little background on yourself and how did you get into woodworking and and then how did you get into turning and and you know what brought you into in making these fantastic pieces of art? Well, um, 
the honor is mine to do this. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, pay it forward for everything the guild has done for providing shows for me to sell my stuff. So I started woodworking, uh, basically seventh grade wood shop. Uh, and after high school, slipped into a career of residential finished carpentry. I did that from the late 80s all the way up till 2008. Uh, got laid off at that recession and just continued working construction what I could. Um, I learned to turn from my dad's best friend when I was 12 years old. I've only, I probably turned 30 bowls in 30 years. Um, in 2015, I got tangled up in my table saw and lost the index finger and chewed up the other fingers pretty good. Through that healing process, that's, I hopped on the lathe and was just uh, playing around, turning simple things one-handed. And uh, it was that aha moment of, I wonder if I could sell bowls instead of going back to construction. Um, Seven years later, here I am, full-time turner. Um, my wife and I traveled the California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and we did 19 major art shows uh, last summer. And we're going to gear up and probably do 22 this coming in, 22 shows in, the, in 23. So this is a full-time uh, gig for me, turning and selling. So thanks for the opportunity to share my stuff. So we're going to um, explain how I make a bowl from a board, a cutting board, basically. Yes, exactly. Um, this is where, we're, this is going to be, there's some pictures of the finished product and what it looks like. And uh, uh, you can see why I was intrigued by this. So let's get, uh, let's go in and see what, uh, how, you, how you did this. Uh, can we? There we go. Go ahead. Tell, what, what do you got here? Um, so this will be a short little video explaining the blank, and hopefully we can uh, explain the... Hi, my name's John Hurden. Um, today... Sorry, John, I interrupted Hi, you. Any... Go, ahead, go ahead and play the video. Okay, here we go. Ah, come on. Hi, my name's John Hurden. Um, today I'm going to be sharing with you the techniques for me. Hi, my name's John Hurden. Um, today, I'm going to be sharing with you the techniques for making a bowl from a board. In this case, we're going to be using this blank, which is a 14 and a quarter diameter by inch and an eighth thick blank. And um, we're going to be cutting five rings, basically four rings and a bottom. And we're going to be using 27 degrees, 35 degrees, 42, and 50 degree entry angles. The Entry angle is dictated by blank thickness as well as the thickness of your kerf. The thicker the blank, the steeper your entry angle can be. Um, so all of these rings are going to be cut from one board. A little bit about the parting tools. I'll be using my custom-made parting tool, carbide tip. This was cut from a 10-inch table saw blade, saving one carbide tip. Uh, disclaimer, I uh, just had the carbide tip replaced. I've uh, broke the old one off. So this will be my first cut with the new, uh, new carbide tip added to it. The width on this is just under an eighth of an inch. I could use a diamond tip parting tool. Um, this cuts quite a bit wider, but it's also beveled, whereas your side entry angle you don't get as the friction on the top and the bottom of the tool, but you do need to allow more kerf removal. Another option is the Henry Taylor thin kerf parting tool. Uh, this is what I started with using. It is uh, quite a bit thinner than my carbide tip cutter, but because it is so wide, as you enter in at steep angles on your smaller diameter rings, you get a lot of friction on the top and the bottom of the cutter. So this one has its advantage and disadvantage. So when you get down. What happened there? Oops. I know. Sorry, Maybe. John. That was my fault. Okay. A little more about my parting chisels. So I actually have two of them. 
and one is a little bit thicker than the other. And when I first showed you these, I got them back from being re-tipped. I had a very bad catch and it, it stopped the work. Um, so I reground the tip. It, when I came back, they were like a 40 degree hook tooth angle. So I've reground them to about 15 degrees and I've kept the tip sharp, but I've dulled the back part of the cutter because as I was entering in, I believe I was catching one, it was too sharp of an angle. I was digging in, grabbing too much wood. And then I was also grabbing on the sides of the cutters, which was causing a catch. And in this case, since I don't actually have a positive drive system, when I have a catch, the plywood keeps spinning, my blank stopped. So there wasn't really much danger of ripping off the lathe and having a catastrophic uh, catch or the bowl getting ripped off. But nonetheless, that was a little uh, unexpected due to tool presentation and tool preparation. Okay. Let's do Okay, so tell us about the bowl thickness, John. So here's a picture of the rings after they've been cut. Um, what we're looking at is the the ring on the top of the picture is a little bit narrower than the, the, the other ring. That's the difference from using the wide cutter and a narrow cutter. Um, it makes your the, bowl thick, the wall thickness a little thinner because um, hopefully we can explain why that happens as we uh, progress through this uh, presentation. Yes. But the, the wall thickness of the bowl is, um, can, is dictated by, you know, basically the thickness of the blank, the angle in which you enter the cut and how much, uh, kerf, you know, is removed from the, from the ring itself as you go from one ring to the next. So, um, mm -hmm. okay. The next video will show me cutting a couple of rings and, and stacking together. So, Okay, let's, let's, let's show it. So. so the first ring cut, this is line up where it went. <laughs> Always trying to figure line them back up. Yeah. Now as you line up, This is, that's your first complete ring. And once again, that is what sets up your wall thickness. So it doesn't, if we can pause that for Joe. Sure. So it's right here. Oops, oops, sorry. Yep. I'm going to move so, up here. Yeah, there we go. The uh, because the rings are tapered, so the the bottom of the ring that was just removed, uh, where it contacts the remaining part of the blank, that is your entry point. Um, now, if I took that first ring and I cut it an inch and a half wide, the angle I'm still only going to have a half inch of overlap onto the remaining blank. So I've just if you cut your first ring too wide. It's just wasted wood. It it's the the angle on which you pass through the the turning blank. I'm having a hard time explaining how to do how to do this just with words. Um, it, it's the amount you travel horizontally through the blank as you're cutting the ring. Uh -huh. um, Got it. So it's kind of like if uh, if you look at when you cut an onion and in half and you stack all the uh the onion rings together basically mm -hmm. we're, we're just making our own onion ring tower from red robin gotcha well, i think this will become clear as we start to um as we cut to see some more of them being cut too That's your first. yeah and if we have to we can go back to the original the first video where i have it drawn out on the uh, plywood mm -hmm. uh, those angles show yeah Okay. Oh, yeah, right. We can do this one here. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, basically, I like using four different angles because rather than creating 
a sloped cone to where the whole bowl has the same angle from top to bottom. Uh -huh. Each ring I kick, in this case, I'm kicking out, you know, changing about seven, eight degrees each time. It mm -hmm. allows for the bottom of the bowl to sweep under. Uh, gives it more of a curved shape. As you can see, the uh, have drawn, you know, transferred the ring ring lines down through the uh, plywood block. Yes, um, got it. So the bottom, the bottom inside part of the first ring is. Right here. Uh, keep going up. Yeah. Follow that line up, up, up right there. Yeah. So the bottom of the first ring. Mm -hmm. is the outside top of the second ring. Oh, okay. And so by cutting, if I was to cut the first ring at, say, a 45-degree angle rather than the 27-degree angle, uh -huh. I would create a thicker wall thickness. Okay. okay. Sorry about that, my fault. Nope. The, the, so, the audios, the videos kind of want to play themselves, and I kind of like, no, you stopped right now. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So basically, by, by using an inch and an eighth thick bowl blank, as I enter in at 27 degrees, yeah. I travel from left to right basically almost a half of an inch. You know, mm -hmm. Now, if I was to enter in at a 45 degree angle, I would travel an inch and an eighth across the bottom of the blank. Sure. And then also, then, then you need to subtract the thickness of your parting tool. So... Um, in this case, it, an inch and eight thick entering at 27 degrees with a just under an eighth of an inch parting tool, I end up with a, just under seven sixteenths of a uh, wall thickness for my first ring. Okay. Um, gotcha. Then as I do each ring adding seven degrees, uh, each ring gets wider and wider anyway. And then that also gives me more room to play with turning the shape of the bottom of the bowl. And we can see how they get wider yeah. here in this drawing. Yeah. So that this last one is quite wide indeed. Wide. Almost, yeah. Yeah. And so I can even remove more of that wood from the outer portion of the bowl to give me more of a, a curved bowl, a spherical bowl, rather than a cone-shaped bowl. Sure, sure. I just like that look. So yeah. when I do the... It looks more like a bowl instead of just an inverted cone, you know? Correct. And, yeah. But when I do a, a piece, so I have another one that I've done from five-eighths of an inch thick stock, and mm -hmm. that I did have to cut it at a 45-degree angle all the way down, and it, it is a cone-shaped bowl, which mm -hmm. I'll show you a picture of that a little later today. Okay, cool. All right, I'm going to skip ahead back to where there's that parting tool. There's the bowl thickness. This is like cutting the first ring, and we we're, we're about halfway through this when we when we Yeah, start well, uh, that. Yeah, the next video is actually a time lapse of me cutting the three, four, and five rings. Yeah. So. So you're now going to the mark that you made when you laid that ring on top of this now, blank. I'm going to switch to 35 degrees for my entry angle. And now my, I'll be, continue to start make more of a bowl pattern rather than just a cone. So we'll just uh, carry on through the rest of this on a time lapse. So here you are just cutting one right after another. I think this is pretty interesting. And then yeah. you've laid out your uh, your your uh, uh, angles there, there on that uh, piece of wood that's yeah, on top so of I, have, I just basically have a, a pressure fit wood sleeve over the top of my tool rest, um, just out of hard rock maple. That way I can write, I, you know, I can draw a line for my uh, in, entry angle and placement of where the tool will lay. Um, mm -hmm. You could do this with just a regular metal tool rest and tape. Um, I was just trying to get this set up for really production. I was hoping to be able to, to do like eight bowls and have the layout already done. Uh, mm -hmm. As it turns out, 
you got to cut each individual ring um, because there's just there's really no room for error in this. Um, the more accurate you stack your rings, the the wider, the thicker you can keep your bowl, and uh, just you know comes out as an, a you know nice usable bowl. My first first several attempts at this, I uh, didn't get my entry angles right, and basically I'd had no overlapping, and I had a sixteenth of an inch uh, bowl thickness. Oh my! That's so back, actually, I have it kicking around here somewhere. Uh, well, you can. We we can take a peek at it later when we when yeah. we do that. Yep. Um, whoops! And we're going to go to one the next one, and the next one. Okay, this video is going to show us how. Uh, now this is your stack of rings here, and uh, I think this is pretty cool with the way this works out. So yeah, this is just how they. You can see how the, the anatomy of the rings. The, yeah, right. You're kind of the Lord of the Rings here, you know. Yeah, people don't believe me when you can get a, a five and a half inch bowl out of one board. Mm -hmm. And now we can just really mess it up and create any uh, any pattern. Sweet. Okay, so we got them all stacked up. Now we're gluing them up. So yep. what do you got here? Looks these look like special tools that you had to buy from Lee Valley. Yeah, this is this is some high end equipment here. So basically, yeah. it's about fifty pounds of lead. So I got uh, twenty pounds of of dive weights in the bags and about thirty pounds of uh, bell weights from fishing and a couple uh, ingots that are all melted together. So I just visually line up. I start, so the left pitcher, I start by gluing the, the bottom and the first ring together. I just visually line up, get them lined up how I, I think they've, they match the best, keep them centered, stack that in for like 15 minutes using tight bond three. And after about 15 minutes, I can carefully handle that and then slip in the next ring, get it glued. And then I just, I continue to uh, stack them on up. Uh -huh. uh, in this case, with a being a 14 inch by uh, five and five eighths bowl, I actually stop. I don't glue the fifth ring on. I take it back to the lathe and I, I mount. I mount it back on the lathe, um, just like I was cutting the ring. I still push it against the plywood backer and I use the tailstock in the center, and I score a about an eight inch diameter mortise on the middle of the third ring. Sure. Let's, actually, I think we got a picture of that. You have a picture of that? Yeah, well, this is uh, actually, this yeah. is where, this is after glue up. So here we're ready for the yeah. final turn. And the bowl on the right, you can, you can see that little scratch right in the middle. There. Yeah. That, right. that's just a, a tiny little mortise that I uh, mount it with, a, with an eight inch uh, expanding jaw. Yeah, so and this so, is our, here's the mounting of this bowl. I don't know the name of that bit. chuck. Yeah. I believe it's a Ellsworth expanding jaw, but typically you have little barrel nuts in there and you, you can clamp clamp your bowls in there. I just use it as a full complete uh, jaw into the mortise. Mm -hmm. I've also modified it slightly. I've taken and filed about a one degree bevel on it. So it is a slight dovetail into that mortise. Oh, uh, uh, okay. So that it jams, it holds really tight. and Jams in there, yeah. And yeah. I, I can exert quite a bit of force on there. Um, I, it'd probably take a good 30 to 50 pounds of tugging on it to yank it off of that, the, the, that set of jaws, how it's set up. Now, it, does, it does this expand as it turns, this, this, these it's jaws? It's a centrifugal, it, you, it, I've never had that one fail on me. It, okay. The only time I've had it fail is just I just didn't have it seated correctly. Gotcha. But yeah, it expands into that that mortise. Mm -hmm. And because you've got that little little slope on it, it jams in there real tight. Then. Yep, and it, it's made in contact by four points. So that's how I reverse mount the bowl. Um, okay. Let's see how you turn it. Here you yep. go. So there, it's it's mounted on that on that uh, expanding jaw, and so I do things a little difficult. I like putting my brand in the bottom of the foot. 
So mm -hmm. this is why I mount the bowl so I have full exposure to the bottom of the bowl without the tailstock in the way. So mm -hmm. this video shows me creating the mortise and uh, the spot where I can uh, mount my brand. As Here soon as I have that work done, I'll bring in the tailstock as I turn up the rest of the diameter of the bowl. You know, I like to turn with the tailstock in as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So watch this video of prepping the outside. So here you're cutting the... the yeah, the, I'm just using a half inch uh, flat scraper to mm -hmm. uh, create a just a flat mortise. I use the skew to put a little dovetail notch in the foot. Uh -huh. um, I like I like putting a little foot on all my bowls. So basically there's a little donut ring in the bottom and that's what actually the bowl will sit on on the table. Um, so oh, there's, yeah, there, there's a tail. There. Yeah. I've just used a, uh, a piece of wood scrap that I cut with a hole saw uh, to, that way I don't have a center point with my tail stock. Yeah. Yeah. It just, well, that's uh that may, okay. That makes perfect sense. Uh, let's see how you cut the inside, huh? Yep. So, all right. And you can barely see the brand there in the bottom, but so now I've just gone to a, a dovetail four jaw chuck and uh, mounted that back in once again. If I can turn with the tail stock in, I do. And this bowl is actually, it's uh, by the time it's finished due to the glue up and the slipping, things aren't exactly lined up perfectly. Uh, starting with a 7 uh wall thickness, I finished it about a quarter inch, maybe 5 16 thick bowl. Really? Um, yeah. I'd say closer to a quarter inch. And I use calipers a lot to so that I maintain consistent thickness all the way down to the sweeping bottom. Mm -hmm. um, I am a member of the funnel club. Inside diameter should not exceed outside diameter. Okay. But yep, occasionally. Oh, uh, and there, there you were removing that final, that mortise I saw there right there. Yeah. Yep. So now I'm all the way. It's that, that curved transition of coming off the, the slope sidewall mm -hmm. and coming across the bottom. And, you know, I've only got a quarter inch of wood between there and the chuck. Wow. Wow. And that's, that's, yeah. that's pretty amazing. And, okay, let's sand her down, huh? Yep. Uh, and you were telling me, oh, there we can see the brand real well. Yeah, that it one did it. It actually shows up better once the finish is on. But yeah, that's, oh uh, sure, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. It's a JHD for John Harden Design. So it actually does say John Harden across the top, and then Design across the bottom, and then JHD. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I think this looks so, like the that looks yeah, this looks like the previous. The, yeah. Let's, whoop. Yeah, here we yeah, go. Sanding. So I start with uh, just using my Festool Rotex sander with uh, 120 grit uh, uh, mesh. Uh, yeah. I use the uh, Abernet mesh. Uh, here's a two inch uh, hook and loop pad and then a three inch hook and loop. Uh, then I graduate up to a five inch uh, padded sander running off the drill. And I literally take this bowl from 120 grit down to uh, 320 grit in probably 15 minutes. Wow. Um, at that point, at 320 grit, I uh, take a damp rag and dampen the whole uh, bowl down, raise the grain, and then I'll take it back through 320 all the way up to 1,000 grit. Oh, and uh, it, just, it just makes the uh, finish pop. Yeah, it really makes it shine. Yeah, there's, then, there's the brand going on. So, the, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the brand going on. So I mean, you, you, you were telling brand. you had a saying that you were telling me about about uh, the cost of sandpaper and uh, yeah, remember? buy buy the best quality sandpaper you can and use it like it's free. Yeah, I I love that saying. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Quit, quit saving those scraps of worn out sandpaper. All they do is create friction and heat. Okay. Well, I'm going to start throwing some of mine away after that. Uh, what finish do you use on these then? I use uh, Odie's oil. 
Okay. Okay. So it's an oil wax combination. And uh-huh. then uh, I actually make a, a bowl butter for maintaining the finish because the Odie's finish, if you're just using the bowl as a display, it'll, you don't need to do any maintenance on it anyway. Um, mm-hmm. But if you're using these as salad bowls, washing them and handling them, uh, I make a bowl butter, which is a mixture of Mahoney's walnut oil, beeswax and carnauba wax, and just buff it on and continue to use it. It's all food safe, so you know, there's no cure time when you re when you re wax your bowl. It's all food safe. So there's no cure time. You can wax your bowl and serve on it that day. Wow! And here the finish you see is a nice semi gloss uh, satin uh, oil wax finish, which is Odie's brand. Okay. It, the Odie's you do need to you wipe it on. Um, use as little as possible. Uh, you can let it sit from five minutes to six hours, I believe, mm-hmm. and take a terry cloth towel and hand buff it back off. Okay. If you do not get it buffed back off, mm-hmm. two weeks down the road, it will look really dull and patchy. You, you've you got to buff off the excess Odie's, otherwise the finish will look terrible in a few weeks. You know, I, that's that's happened to me on... Some of my projects, I've been using an oil that uh, I did. I don't. I didn't buff it off properly. And then, and when you said use as little as possible, I didn't. I kind of soaked this one project, and the oil actually soaked right through the board. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I should have just put it on, wiped it right off, and uh, um, I would have been in good shape. Um, so there, you know, there. That's that's pretty much our presentation. And if you, people got questions, uh, I haven't seen any pop up on the chat, and uh, I don't know if there's any from the from the gang out there. But uh, um, one of the th- couple things I was wondering about, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing here so that we can get back to live action. Uh, you were doing. Um, you showed me a couple things that you were doing the other day i don't know if you've got them here with you that one spherical uh yep. would you call it a hogshead bowl or something like that i call it the the pig nose vase yeah it's a uh, multi-axis turning so it's got three carved feet on the bottom and an orientation to the entry point is a bugled entry and uh into the sphere so, so you carve out that so you you carve this whole thing all out by sticking a, some kind of tool inside there and and and, and cutting it all out and the, so it's, yeah. so it's all so, yeah so i've i remounted in the lathe to where uh the nose is turning true and so all the hollowing is done through that snout but oh so these legs are out here twirling around knuckle busters uh they're in the way so i've got a I've made a cone that i can clamp this into the lathe and turn through there. So pretty fun little little project. Um, so be, kinda, yeah, that one blew me away. And the fact that the feet are actually part, they're not glued on. They're actually no, part of the bowl or part of the, are, yeah. You can see the spalt lines going oh right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Spalt yeah, of maple yeah. burl. Yeah. And it's, a, it's about an eighth of an inch thick all the way through. Oh my gosh. That, that one blew me away. And, uh, uh, and then you had a like what you call a dazzle bowl, or so. Well, this this is oh boy, <laughs> it's another version of a bowl from a board. Uh-huh. So this one is shaped a little more cone shape. Yeah. The bowl blank itself started out uh, five eighths of an inch thick bowl blanks. I believe I had uh, fifty strips glued together of maple, paduke, bloodwood, uh, walnut. Wingate, uh, well, basically the the wood alanche, the the pile of scrap in the shop gets glued back together into these. <laughs> Nothing and, goes uh, to waste. Yeah. So yeah. being that this was a five eighths inch thick blank, I uh-huh. had to use a forty five degree entry angle. Uh, and yeah. the fact that it was thinner, steeper angle, but still a fourteen inch diameter bowl. I was still, I got six rings out of this. Uh So the thicker the bowl, you get less rings, but the steeper angle you can start. So it just becomes a a geometry game of how to get all these here. And so 
and this is the finished bowl. Oh, this that's the bowl we were seeing done. Yes. Sweet. So yeah. And it, yeah, so it's 14 inches in diameter and five and five eighths tall. Actually, five and a half by the time I mill all the anomalies out of it. So, hey, John, this is Ed from the studio. Can you hear us? Yes. Hi, Ed. How are you doing? When you Good. when you put that that glued up board on your piece of plywood, that was nothing more than a friction fit. Is that correct? Correct. That's just a piece of uh, it was. It started out as a piece of oak plywood screwed to a faceplate, three quarter inch plywood. And do you put any sandpaper or anything on the plywood to provide any additional friction? I did at one point, and I cut through and hit the sandpaper. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that didn't sharpen your tools. Uh, no, uh, it, it had an end. So, and I've, I've learned that it's actually that nice sort because... of like a. You consider that plywood like a a, a sacrificial surface. You yes, constantly replacing it. Yeah. Um, so far, it's still my original piece of plywood, and I've probably made probably close to twenty five bowl from boards with it. So, um, I've cut a hundred rings. Um, and, and what's what's sort of your your ideal diameter starting disc? I like the fourteen inch because not only so I've got a twenty inch powermatic lathe, a fourteen inch square. Sometimes I will leave the whole top square, and this fourteen inch square is nineteen inches corner to corner, so I can turn a square top bowl with the fourteen inch. Plus, so I got. What you're telling me is I need a bigger lathe. Yeah, yeah. always <laughs> get a bigger lathe. You can turn little things on a big lathe, but you can't turn big things on a little lathe. There you go. So, but yeah, the 14 inch. Uh, so I've got a 15 inch planer. The uh, 14 inch blanks fit through it real well. Um, I like a 13 to 14 inch salad bowl. Um, yeah. They uh, they seem to sell real well. Um, I haven't I haven't really got into making other bowls that are uh, larger. It seems like the larger bowls don't seem to sell. But you know you can definitely get a lot more money for them, but they just don't sell very often. Yeah, I the, try and create yeah. functional art. And, and, and fourteen inches are, is a good size. And John, if you don't mind asking, on that square bowl you just showed us. What would be your your price on something like that? The the square tops I'm asking three fifty and the round tops three hundred. Okay. And so John, you're going to be it together in the guilds, aren't you? You're, you're going yes. to yeah. Okay. Because that's yeah. where I saw you last. So hang on, one, hang on one one second. I'm going to get a question from our audience. Okay. Oh, they kind of you got a weave. brick pattern or something, a, a cross weave in the back, a bowl in the back, and he's, the question is, how did you make that? Oh, that that's the basket the weave? One over his shoulder? Yeah. Weave. Basket weave. That's the one. That is a basket weave. How did you make that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you, but then I'll have to shoot you. Yeah, I got you. Okay, but... Uh... That one's a good one. Well, maybe that'll be our next presentation. Will be how you make the basket weave, boy. That yep. is. A yep. So this is a. It's a. Basically, a three to one pattern. So, the. Um, I call it the sandwich. So in this case, I've taken a piece of three quarter inch maple, glued eighth inch walnut to either side. Um, actually, that sandwich is about an inch thick. So. The cherry squares are one inch thick, so two squares in the sandwich create three inches. So I cut three inches and three inches. They all go. This is not cut. a bowl from a board. This is actually a solid. I glue yeah, okay. this. Into the, this is not a bowl from a board. It's a solid okay. blank. And I actually will core. I've already you sold get, the uh, whole setup. Nice. I've, yeah, I've already cool. sold the the medium bowl out of this one. And not only that, I haven't put the mirror in it yet, but I take and cut the ring off the back and this becomes a mirror frame. <laughs> so, 
It looks better as a mirror. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, sometimes it has a really ugly picture. Yeah, so, right. This is so. Oh I, yeah, a couple exactly. of earrings. You can hang it. I don't know. We're gonna get a weird reflection. So you can hang it vertical and, orientation, or uh -huh. you can hang it uh, forty-five. Oh my gosh! But yeah, I started cut cutting these rings off, thinking, you know, why why do I keep throwing this away as sawdust? Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, now I've been starting to save save rings where I can, and so even when I'm have a solid bulb blank, um, if I can cut the ring off, I'll save that ring because another mm -hmm. another type of uh, yeah. segmenting I do is basically your true segmented rings where they get stacked. Um, these are all a 16 inch piece rings they're all stacked together on top of a solid canary wood bottom. But there's nothing to say if I had a walnut ring, I couldn't just insert a solid walnut ring in here somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I just, I save as much, the wood goes as far as I can make it go. Mm -hmm. but, oh. And yeah, this one's canary wood, purple heart, wingate, and maple. Okay. And um, so it's about 15 inches in diameter, uh, four and a half inches deep. And this is a four hundred dollar bowl. Yeah, I bet it is. I don't. That doesn't. That's yeah. that's that's a good price for that. I mean, so I that's the it. kind of thing that you set out on the table, and everybody goes, "Whoa!" You know, when you yeah. set that thing on the full of salad, you know. Yeah. So I've sold this one's twin, which this one it's twin. I did. Um, so it's canary wood in the bottom, but and I did wingate and babinga instead of purple heart. So that one sold right away, and this one hopefully won't uh, make it to too many shows this year. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. What state are you in? I'm in Grants Pass, Oregon. Oh, okay. So, yeah, but I'm uh, headed to Seattle in two weeks. So, yeah, my first show for this season. Last, that, that last poll you showed us with the canary wood bottom, uh, the question here is how many hours did it take you to make that bowl? Um, I made eight of those in a week. Mm -hmm. About one a day then, or, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, plus, basically I had, I spent one day just simply gluing yep. rings. Um, yep. the next day was cutting bottom blanks or, you know, parts of it, um, mm -hmm. It was also filled in with, uh, well, oh, it's probably even gluing together bowl from boards. Because usually when I do a batch of bowl from boards, I'll do 10 to 15 of them. Um, mm -hmm. I also I also do a plaid. So this is a handled platter. Um, I dovetail the handle in. Yeah. So there's always something gluing up in the shop. So, um, you know, you cut, you glue, you know, you kick that aside. You got to wait. You know, I always wait at least. I like waiting a week before I truly turn something. I'll, I'll go 24 hours before I plane it or cut it. Or if I do small little preps to it, but I like to allow the glue to fully cure before I go through final cutting and sanding, um, especially with the sanding, you create that friction and that heat. If that glue is not cured, I find that it the it it'll the glue will soften up and kind of expand and contract in sure. the joint. So I like to let everything cure. So I'm always I just glue stuff up, kick it aside, mm -hmm. turning stuff, um, as well as I also have solid, you know, solid wood pieces. Okay, that's great. But, I just, being a finished carpenter, I love gluing wood together and creating geometric patterns that I can, so. You you also, over your right shoulder, you have like a big, uh, looks like almost a burl. It's um, uh, underneath the bowl for boards. It's kind of, yep. it's like a tulip kind of shaped uh, bowl, uh, bowl. That one, yes, that one. This oh, is God. a monstrous piece of Pacific U with oh, black epoxy. 
It's uh, 17 and a half inches across, uh, about 14 inches on the narrow side, uh, nine inches tall, plus with three carved feet. So oh my the core that came out of this is uh, 15 inches across. I still haven't turned it yet. I got you. So, but so, I'm not so too you'll sure. Turn, you'll turn like another bull or a, yeah. or something else out of that core. Yeah. Yep. And this one, I originally had $900 on it, and I've lowered this to $775. Okay. Um, this has traveled with me to just about all of the shows last year, and it no one has quite decided to buy it yet. So, okay. as I say, the bigger pieces take a lot longer to sell. Yeah. They're, it's a harder market, fewer, you know, but right. I easily see this sitting as a centerpiece on someone's dining room table. Yeah. The, the feet on that and, and the other bowl you showed, the, the pig bowl or whatever you called it, those are not glued on. Those are integral to the original piece of wood? Correct. And and so how, how'd you do that? How'd you manage to turn the outside surface without yeah. it hitting the feet? The... Basically, all of my bowls are turned with a, they're all turned with a foot. Mm -hmm. okay. So basically, those three legs are just a, a bigger cone for the foot, and then I carve the legs out. Um, okay. Usually. So that bowl, that bowl had, a, had three inches of additional depth on the bottom. Correct. When you got done turning it. Well, or not more much or less. Because the it's hard to see when it's not on a table. The bottom of this uh sweep is only about a half inch off the table. Okay. So and fact, you were saying on that pig bowl that you you actually have bowl, to yeah, that there it is it's elevated up pretty good. Um and uh, you did like three dimensional you like three different setups for the turning of that, right? Or what did you tell me yesterday? It was uh, okay. I just lost my my Zoom. No, uh, we're still seeing you. We still see really? you. Okay, still I've lost you. all of you guys. Well, well we're not. Uh, that we're not that important. We're still here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're still. Yeah, you're still here. Yeah, I just can't see what I'm showing you now. Oh, gotcha. I don't know what I did. Well, I went to turn the screen and. Did something. Well, I think, it, I think it was Joe's fault. I'm sure it was. I just don't know how. <coughs> well, John, uh, um, um, the, you, know, you were telling me, though, on that pig bowl that you had actually done that. You'd, you'd chucked it up three different ways, right? You said it was, you call it almost like three dimensional. Turning or something? Didn't you yeah, use multi-axis? So multi-axis. Oh, yeah, yeah. So basically, centered of the feet is out here an imaginary point out this here. Yeah, got it. And then I turn it so center of the snout to an imaginary point here. So those two imaginary points have been uh, turned away. Right. So I start by turning this on you know center to center, and I start roughing you know, roughing everything out. In fact, there's a large section across this back side that I literally have to hand carve off because oh. uh, as I'm turning, I can't turn the full sphere because you start to hit the, the snout. And when right. you turn the snout, you can't hit because you start hitting the legs. Right. Um, this one would be a fun, fun one to show all the steps. Um, yeah. But I'm well, still maybe, scratching my head as I do these, so that th those are still in the experimental phase. Well, we can. Uh, I'd be I'd be happy to bring you back, and we could, um, you know, we could do uh, another another round of some of this. I'm I'm sure this has been. Well, I would think if if I I mean not, even not being a turner, I'm just like blown away by them. I mean they're they're extraordinarily interesting. Um, for those who want to get a hold of John. Um, if you go to Facebook or Instagram and you search for John Harden Design, 
Um, and once again, Harden is H A R D E N. If you go to John Harden Design, just search for that. You'll be able to pull it up. And his email is uh, jharden4418 at gmail.com. That's jharden4418 at, at gmail.com. Yep. John, thank yeah. you very much. We really yeah. appreciated it. Well, the honor was mine. And uh, yeah, I hope we can uh, find the time to do this again. I, oh, so yeah. so what, what I'm going to suggest to you and I'm going to suggest to our crowd here is we have a uh, a corollary group that is has a lot of our members, Northwest Wood Turners Association. John Beachwood is here in our audience today. He's vice president or something of that organization, some mucky muck. Yep. Um, it probably, you know, the more advanced processes that you're talking about would probably be a good presentation for that group. And then our group can kind of join some of them. And if mm -hmm. we're interested to learn a little bit more about what you do yeah okay. yeah this this bull from a board wasn't exactly a, a beginner project but um <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna do it tomorrow on my bigger <laughs> lathe yeah so um uh, i that that's great john it's been a really great presentation I, uh it was really fun working with you as we worked through these videos and um and made that powerpoint and that was really that was really great um well, I, I appreciate your uh expertise on the the technical side because i'm i'm lucky i was able to just film it on my phone and send you the, the videos it, it, i think next we, time i'll send you uh better videos on a thumb drive okay um, that's what that's what we'll do yeah. um thank you very much uh for my for the members of the and that are there at the guild. Uh, I'd like some feedback and give it to maybe Ed and I uh, about uh, how what you think of having the the meetings at the studio. How's how's it working? Just uh, um, I have the uh, the Mac reserved, but uh, I have also told her that I'm probably going to cancel. So I'd just like to see if it worked well. This is our first meeting there. And uh, I think it's a great place to do it, but I want to hear the, the feedback from the people who are there. And with that, I'm done, Ed. Back All to right, you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, John. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Just a couple of a couple of wrap up things. One, I, I did mention Northwest Wood Turners Association. It's a it's another group. If you're interested in that type of work, or if you're interested in turning, we here in the guild don't have any lathes in our shop in either one of our shops so it's a great corollary complementary skill that you can apply to all kinds of woodworking not that we want everybody defecting but we want to be a big happy family um if there are any new members here i know there are a few new members if you can just stick around for a few minutes and get with mike right here uh, just to maybe do a quick orientation introduction, just to kind of get to know one another, that would be great. Um, if you are sitting on a chair, I'd like, we would appreciate it if you could help us uh, remove those chairs from the studio and take them over to the annex. We'll have somebody over there to show you where the rack is and where they go. And then I learned, I learned a, a bunch of things tonight. One is I need to buy new sandpaper. Um, <laughs> I still have all the same sandpaper scraps that I that I continue to use. Uh, I would, and I need a bigger uh, lathe. So with that. Check out, um, um, it, hello, this is John. So yeah, I buy my stuff on uh, a website, 2Sand, as well as a wood turner store. Okay. So uh, I know a lot of you guys are probably more tech savvy than I am. If I can actually find these things on the internet, uh, you can too. But the uh, the Abernet five inch discs, they're they are actually about a dollar a piece. But um, you know, when when you're sanding out a three hundred dollar bowl, a couple dollars in sandpaper doesn't matter. All right, thank you for that. Are there is there any other announcements or? items for the good of the cause and we are adjourned everybody i want to thank you all for coming i hope you enjoyed the presentation here in the studio i think it worked out great from my perspective yeah so 